It is uh, my privilege to introduce my good friend, uh, Dan Estes. We were, nearly the, I think the entire time I worked at Cedarville, he was my colleague. And there are people who are great scholars, and there are people who have great, tender, compassionate hearts, and Dan is both. And please give him a warm, uh, central welcome. Well, it really is a pleasure for me this morning to be here. I've prayed for Carl and his family for many, many years. And by extension, when he came here to Central, uh, I started praying for you as well. And even though I didn't know you, I couldn't visualize what the church was like. And so when Carl asked me a few months ago if I'd be willing to come and, and preach, it really came as a special treat to be able to do this. This morning, I'd like for us to consider a, an image that's found in the Bible that uh, I first started understanding back when I was a very young boy. One of my early memories is when I was about six years old, and I, was, I found myself quite excited that summer because for the first time, I was going to be able to go to vacation Bible school. Now, it wasn't because I had thoughts of becoming a Bible professor you know, in the future. Uh, it was because I had heard my older sisters talk about vacation Bible school, and I was especially fascinated by the idea that you go someplace at church and they'd give you cookies and Kool-Aid and let you play outside. I thought, this is, that's, that sounds like a great deal. And so finally the time came when it was time for vacation Bible school. And it wasn't hard to get there because my dad was the pastor, the church was right next door, so it was just a matter of walking across the yard, going downstairs into the musty basement of our church, and there I had a chance to learn God's Word. One of the things we learned that week was a chorus that went like this. Walking with Jesus, walking every day, walking all the way. Walking with Jesus, walking with Jesus alone. Although, I think probably it sounded more like, Walking with Jesus. You know, I was six. I can remember, even as a young boy, thinking about those words. I knew what it was to walk. I'd done a lot of walking there in our little town in, in the mountains in New York. And I could picture what it was like to walk with someone, because I had often walked with my dad, uh, holding hands, walking down to the stream, or walking up into one of the mountains. I'd seen pictures of Jesus. Now, granted, it probably was an authentic picture of what a Jewish boy in the first century looked like, but I had a picture in my mind of what Jesus was. So walking with Jesus, walking alone, I could get a sense for what that was. Little did I realize at that time that God was using that song to plant in my mind a seed of a thought, of a concept, of an image that I later came to understand is found all throughout the Bible. And I've come to learn that it's really at the heart of what it means to have a relationship with God over time. I found a few years after that, I was reading a child version of the Pilgrim's Progress. And once again, that idea of a person walking with God and walking toward God's home, the celestial city, that was prominent. Later on, when it came time to write my doctoral dissertation, I thought, what am I going to write on? And I went back to this image of the Christian as the pilgrim or as the sojourner and worked on that. And so this is something that both personally and professionally has been with me for decades now. And as I said, it really is at the heart of what it means for all of us to have a relationship with God. I've found that, as I've looked in the Bible, that there are many, many references to walking in the Bible. Now, many of them are just someone walked from point A to point B. But many of them have a real important spiritual dimension to them. 
For example, in Psalm 84, verse 11, the psalmist there says that no good thing will God withhold from those who walk uprightly. They're walking with God. They're walking uprightly. A verse of, of tremendous theological uh, uh, impact is Micah 6.8 that talks about how, what is it that God requires of us? He requires that we do justice, that we love mercy, and that we walk humbly with our God. Once again, that image of walking. In the New Testament, in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, Paul talks about how we are to walk in newness of life. And then in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, he says, walk in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, and if you do, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, walk in the light as, as Christ is in the light, and you'll have fellowship not only with him, but with one another. And in the book of Ephesians, Paul five times uses that verb, walk, when he challenges the Ephesian Christians and all of us in what it means to live the Christian life. What I'd like to do this morning is to turn our attention way back in the early pages of the Bible to look at two people who lived out this metaphor and from them learn some lessons for today in what it means to live as God's people. We're going to look at Abraham, and then we're going to look beyond that to two earlier figures, to Enoch and to Noah. First of all, Abraham. In, Ge in Ge Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, God comes to Abraham. He says, I am God Almighty. I'm El Shaddai. Now, this is what I want you to do. And in six words, he gave the marching orders for Abraham. He said, walk before me and be blameless. Walk before me and be blameless. Now let's take that and unpack it to see what it's saying. The first thing we notice is that there, there's an action, there's an activity. God says, walk. Now what does it mean to walk? There are a lot of verbs that God could have used, used here. He could have said, stand before me. He could have said, sit before me. He could have said, run before me. But walking is different from all of those things. Walking isn't the same as standing. Walking isn't the same as running. It's certainly not the same as racing. It's not the same as meandering or wandering. Walking emphasizes steady progress over the long haul in a certain direction. Steady progress over the long haul in a certain direction. Now walking is something that we learn very early in life. My youngest granddaughter just turned one year old a couple weeks ago. And she's just at that lovely stage where she's standing up and just getting ready to walk. And usually that's about the time, isn't it? Right about a year, give or take a month or so. Both of my parents have passed on. And long after they were running or mowing the lawn or washing windows, they were walking right up to the very end. Walking is a routine activity that begins very early in life. It continues throughout life right up to the very end. Walking speaks of consistency in the routine of life. Eugene Peterson wrote a book entitled Long Obedience in a Single Direction. And that really is what walking is, isn't it? It's long obedience in a single direction. When God called Abraham to walk, he called Abraham to do something that all of us are able to do over most of our lives. In other words, God wasn't looking for stars. He was looking for 
regular people like you and me. Back when my, daughter, my daughter-in-law was in college, uh, she was a sprinter. At that time, I was running marathons, and so we had some interesting conversations about sprinting as over against distance running. I can remember saying to her, Sharon, Sharon, now I've, I've seen the workouts that sprinters do. You warm up for, you know, about a half hour, it seems, stretching and like that, and then you practice a half a dozen starts, and then you have to cool down. I said, what is that? That's not a workout. Come with me for a 10-mile run. Then we'll talk about which is really proper workout. God is calling us to be more like the marathon runners, the distance guys, than the sprinters. The sprinters are able to succeed on talent alone. But it takes that consistency, that practice, that faithfulness, if you're going to win the long race. So first God calls Abraham and all of us to walk, to long obedience in a single direction. Then he says, walk before me. Walk before me. Now literally, in the Hebrew, this means walk in my eyes or walk under my gaze. In other words, he's saying, Abraham, in the routine of your life, always be consciously aware that I am watching you. I'm evaluating you. I know what you're doing. I'm examining what you're doing. For most of us, it's been a while since we were in, in eighth grade. Uh, but if you can get back there in your thinking, imagine walking into your eighth grade English class and noticing that something was different this day because rather than your regular teacher being there, there's a sub. Now, when I use this illustration with my college students, it hasn't been that long for them, and they immediately remember, and the look of recognition comes in their eyes because they realize, oh, yeah, that was an interesting day. And I ask them, now, what did the other kids do on that day? You know, don't want them to incriminate themselves. So what did you watch the other kids do when the sub was there rather than the regular teacher? And I get all sorts of interesting stories about, oh, yeah, changed names or changed seats or, or shot spit wads or did all sorts of things. You know, I mean, nothing that they would do when the real teacher was there. Because they knew that the person that was going to give them the grade wasn't there to see what they were doing. The person who had their mom's phone number on speed dial was not there to call on them. You see, if you're not consciously aware that someone who's evaluating you is watching you, then you know, pretty much anything happens. In our lives, we need to do what a friend of mine referred to as practicing the presence of Christ. Recognize that Christ is with us wherever we are, watching what we're doing. He's listening in on every conversation. He's probing our hearts, evaluating what our motive is, what our intention is, even when we're able to kind of get that past someone else who isn't aware. In other words, when we walk before God, we ask, what is it that God wants me to do? What is it that pleases him? You know, in our culture, it's very easy for us to become pragmatic and say that whatever works, that's good for me. Or we can become relativistic and saying whatever I want to do, whatever I choose to do, that's what's good for me. Or we can become hedonistic. Whatever gives me pleasure, well, that's good for me. But for the person who walks before God, the real question in life is, what is it that pleases God? That then becomes what is good for me to do, or to say, or to think, or to desire. That is the standard. Now, we've seen that there is an activity, walk. 
There is an attitude, walk before me, walk under the gaze of God. And then there's a third thing, there is an accomplishment. Because the sense of, that, of the expression here is, walk under my gaze, and as a result, you will become blameless. And the word blameless here means complete or whole. It means to have integrity. A life that throughout all of it is this, on the same page, honoring and glorifying God. Now, this isn't talking about sinless perfection because we know from 1 John that if we say that we're beyond the capacity for sin or we can become, but that we're just kidding ourselves. But it is talking about the kind of person who is consistently doing what God is pleased in. You see, the more we walk under the gaze of God, the more we walk before God, the more we please Him. And the more we please Him, the more we become like Him. Because the more we do what God approves, the more our lives become what He designed them to be. They become lives of integrity, lives of blamelessness, lives of completeness. Some people have the wrong notion that all God is interested in is saving people so that he can get heaven populated. But you know, if you ask the Apostle Paul, what is it that God is all about? What is your ministry all about? Paul said in Colossians chapter 1 verse 28, the goal of my ministry is to present every person complete in Christ. It's the same sense as what we have back in, in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, walk before me and you will become complete. God is interested in transforming our lives so that as we walk before him, we become more and more like Christ. And that is demonstrated by the fruit of the Spirit being consistently evidenced in our lives. Lives that ooze love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. That is what God is endeavoring to do in people that walk before him. Now, I said we are going to be going back and looking at several people in Genesis. We've seen, Gen we've seen Gen Genesis chapter 17, Abraham, but we can go back even further into the early pages of the Bible, and there we find two people, Enoch in chapter 5, verses 22 and 24, and Noah in chapter 6, verse 9, where the same thing is said about both of these men. It's said there that they walked with God. Now notice the different preposition there. With Abraham, it was walk before me, under my gaze. Now we're talking about two men who walked with God, walked in association with him, walk in accompaniment with him. Supposing you're sitting in church and you hear a text come on your phone. Now, of course, you don't look at it in church because that's something you wait till after church, right? But, uh, but on your way out after church, you realize a good friend has said, hey, let's walk Clifton Gorge this afternoon. It's a beautiful Sunday. Many of you, no doubt, have been to Clifton and the gorge there that cuts down through into John Bryan State Park and uh, say, okay, great. And so you meet there in Clifton, and you start walking on the path, and, and after you get a short while on the path, you have a choice to make. You can either stay up on top of the rim, or you can go down into the gorge and walk along the stream. And your friend says, you know, the one who's just sent you the note, um, text, let's walk this in gorge, says, how about if I walk along the rim, and you go down along the stream, and I'll meet you at the end? And you say, hey, just a minute, I thought we were going to walk together through Crippling Gorge. But you're not, not, not going to walk with me. You see, if we walk with someone, we have to stay on the same path, don't we? You can't be on two different paths and walk with someone. And so walking with God means staying on God's path. Now, we're often tempted 
to choose some other path of life. But Proverbs chapter 4, verses 26 and 27 says, Watch the path of your feet and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Turn your foot from evil. If we're going to walk with God, we have to stay on God's path. Now, what that means is that God is walking on his path. And if we're going to walk with God, we have to stay close to him. It's not like, God, I've got this path here, and you, I'm willing to have you come walk with me on my path. No. God has a path, and our job, our responsibility, is to stay close to God on the path that he's going, walking with him. A number of years ago, I took my family back to the small town in New York where I grew up because I wanted my children to be able to experience the, the mountains as, as I had experienced them and enjoyed them so much. And so uh, we got there. I didn't tell them the whole story about what it was like to climb this one mountain that I had in mind um, because I knew that they wouldn't do it. Um, but we got down to the trailhead and uh, there was a ranger station there and we signed in and uh, my wife happened to tell the ranger, oh, we're climbing up Mount Wittenberg uh, today. And he looked at her, really? And because uh, we had three young children with us. And uh, she said, yeah. He goes, he just kind of looked, and she didn't realize later on how significant that look was. But uh, a couple of hours later, as we are continuing to walk up this mountain, uh, my daughter just was dragging behind, and oh, that would never get to the top. This is awful. You know, just, just lagging behind. Come on, Christiana, you can do this. We got up close to the top. And our youngest son just, he couldn't contain himself. He just took off and started running. We yelled, Joel, Joel, come back. He just, he, he had to get to the top. And he came back about 10 minutes later. I've been to the top. It's amazing up here. You got to come. He was running ahead. With God. If we are going to walk with him, we have to stay on his path and we have to stay at his pace. There's something about us that when God says, let's go, we, but I, we come up with excuses, we slow it down. Or other times, God, you're too slow for me. I've got to run ahead of you. We stay on God's path rather than turning to the right or to the left because we trust him for his destination for us. We stay at his pace, not lagging behind or running ahead because we trust him for every item on his itinerary for us. I found that that itinerary sometimes has some surprising features. God's taken me on some hairpin turns where I thought, but I thought we were going this way and I'm going this way now. What's all that about? But you know those hairpin turns sometimes lead to the most scenic parts of the trip if we're willing to take them with God. I have found just how important Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is. Where the, where the wise man there says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Our understanding doesn't understand very much. In all of your ways, know him. Stay close to him. And he will make your path straight. Now what is it that we learn from Abraham, from Enoch, from Noah, we learn that the godly walk stays in step with God. The godly walk stays in step with God. Now this principle has a number of implications for our lives, and let me suggest three. The first implication has to do with learning God's direction. There's something about us that um, often <laughs> we find ourselves going to God saying, God, I've got all these plans here. I've got it all worked out, and I just need to have your signature here uh, to get approval. 
I have students do this. They get their schedule all put together, and they've got to get their, their advisor to sign off on it, but they really don't want me to give any suggestions. They just, you know, they, they, just, they just need my, my John Henry. Rather than asking God to ratify our plans, when we stay in step with God, we give God a blank slate and ask him to reveal his plan for us. Rather than talking to God, telling him what we want, we listen to God tell us what he wants for us. You see, we often want to know God's will in advance. God, give me the map quest with all of the different instructions so I, and the destination so I know exactly how it all works out. And you know what we do with map quests. We say, but I think I know a better way. And, you know, <laughs> I have found that God's direction for us is more like a GPS where he says, now, take this turn. And we keep on that road until he says, now, turn right. Or, now, turn left. We have to keep listening so that we can learn God's direction for us. Secondly, adopting God's desires. A lot of times, we want to insist on what we think is best or what we want. But when we stay in step with God, we live by the truth of Psalm 37 verse 4. That verse says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you what your heart truly desires. So many times we think we desire one thing, but what we really want is something else, and God knows what we in our heart of hearts really crave. Trust in the Lord. He'll guide your path. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you what your heart truly desires. God knows our heart better than we ourselves do. We can trust him to satisfy our heart's true desires. And then thirdly, enjoying God's delight. Many times we're tempted to strike out on our own, to do it our way. And sorry, Frank Sinatra, doing it your way is not the best way. It's when we have companionship with God, we do it God's way, that's when we find real delight in life. You see, when God made humans, he made us in his image so that we could enjoy a relationship with him, a person-to-person -person relationship with him. Back in the Garden of Eden, before Adam and Eve messed it up with sin, God used to come in the cool of the day and walk with them in the garden. That's what he designed humans to do. And ever since Adam and Eve fell into sin, God has been seeking to get his creatures back into relationship with him so that he can enjoy that companionship with us and we can enjoy that companionship with him for which we were made. We delight in the presence of God as we maintain routine faithfulness that stays in step with him. You see, the key to the Christian life is not rocket science. It's something much simpler than that. Those of you who have a car know that you have to get it serviced regularly if you want that car to run well. We all know that to feel our best physically, we need to have a good diet, adequate sleep, regular exercise, nothing exotic there pretty basic. And the same is true in our spiritual lives. The key to a good spiritual life is not having impressive talents, because only a few people have those. It's not having remarkable skills, uh, spirit, or spiritual gifts, because only a few people have those. It's not outstanding achievements, advanced knowledge. It's something far more simple and attainable for all of us. The key to good spiritual health is staying in step with God 
it all comes back to the walk. A routine lifestyle of walking before God and walking with God over time forms us into the people that God wants us to become. So what in a word does this image teach us? Simply this. Staying in step with God transforms us so that we become more and more like Him. And that, in a sentence, is the Christian life. Let's pray. Our Father, sometimes we make things so complicated when you have made them so simple. Sometimes we are so easily distracted when you want us to keep our focus on the main thing. And so we ask, O oh Lord, that throughout this week ahead, as we walk, we would remember to walk as you want us to walk. To walk before you, to walk with you, so that we may become the people that you want us to be and enjoy companionship with you as you want us to enjoy it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dan, I want to thank you for uh, leading us in the scriptures and challenging us to walk with God. Let me say a word of prayer as we close. Father, uh, you are an amazing God, and we want to walk with you. Lord, help us not to get ahead of you. Help us not to lag behind you. Help us to go on the detours that you call us to go on. Lord, help us to walk worthy of who you have called us to be. Lord, I, I pray that in a very real way that as we leave as individuals uh, this Sunday, that we will walk by your side this week, going to the places where you want us to go, saying and doing the things that you want us to do. And Lord, I also pray that this will be true for us as a body of Christ. I pray this will be true for us as a church. Lord, I pray that this will be a church where uh, your will, not our will, is done. pray that this will be a church where your spirit can move freely, uh, taking us where you want us to go, for your glory and for your kingdom. And we pray that you would give us ears to, to hear your spirit, give us hearts to obey. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.